All right, this is another day of uh, ShopBot training. Uh, we're gonna get into it uh, by learning some aluminum. Um, I think most of you know me, I am uh, Ryan Patterson here for or at ShopBot. Um, I'm actually at the uh, office today. Uh, it is uh, good to get out and about. Um, first time in about a month I've managed to make it in. Um, so a bit strange uh, of a commute, but uh, here we are again for another day of training. Uh, so today, this is uh, again, uh, another personal project of mine. I needed to, uh, a little switch plate cover uh, for uh, interior of uh, my van. Uh, so it's just for, uh, you know, a camper van. Uh, I needed some accessory uh, switches. And so there are just these little round toggle switches that uh, I needed to place into aluminum. and. Uh, I could have used anything, but uh, aluminum uh, kind of matches up to some other items that I already have in there um, that I bought. So I wanted to have something similar and matching. Uh, this is the video uh, of what I actually cut this morning. So you're going to see the whole process um, on how I went about cutting this. And uh, I, I have a blooper to, to show off. Um, uh, and we'll see uh, what happens. And also notice that I kind of got lucky that uh, this was the uh, final cut. Uh, the part when it was done cutting was no longer sitting where it was cutting, it was sitting over here. Um, so I'll explain why that part is over there. I did not put it there, uh, it put itself there. Um, so uh, we'll uh, see the whole process, uh, both in learning my failures and uh, how I got lucky and also what I did to correct uh, some of the issue. Um, so uh, we're going to get started, uh, going to go into Aspire. Um, again, we could use uh, VCarve Pro, just the same for this project. Uh, there is no difference between uh, VCarve Pro and Aspire as far as the two-dimensional aspect of the work goes. Um, it is uh, different in the 3D modeling tab. So Aspire, you do have a lot of extra modeling uh, tabs uh, and buttons and functions to do. Uh, there on the uh, the 3D um, tab or the modeling tab. Um, but uh, other than that, we still have the same buttons and uh, tabs down below. Tool pathing and everything works uh, just the same way. Um, as we get uh, started, uh, feel free to uh, uh, use the, the chat window to ask any questions. Um, I will uh, keep an eye on monitoring that, um, certainly will answer them, uh, even if the uh, question is not directly related to uh, the step that I'm showing or even directly related to uh, this project at all. Um, you know, we're here to help uh, in whatever aspect of cutting you are. Uh, so this should be a fairly quick uh, training session, uh, which will leave us uh, open time at the end of uh, the training for uh, hopefully a good uh, question and answers, uh, but uh, we will see. So what I first started off to create this project is uh, just going into new. And entering in the size of the material. So the material that I had was a 12 inch by 12 inch with a Z of an eighth of an inch. The uh, units that I was working with in inches and I did set the Z0 to the uh, table surface. This is one of the benefits of uh, me coming into ShopBot today uh, to, to use uh, the, the machine at work is uh, the Max, uh, desktop Max that I was cutting this on has a, uh, a vacuum table on it. And uh, it is also an automatic tool changer that uh, made uh, this a little bit easier for me because I did use two separate cutters uh, for this job. And uh, it still allowed me to zero the, uh, to the table surface or the machine bed. The benefits here uh, to machine, uh, zeroing to the machine bed is, I, I only have through cuts in this uh, project. There isn't any surface cuts or any uh, depth critical cuts from the surface down. Um, but I don't want, especially with the vacuum table, I don't want to cut into the table surface more than I have to. Uh, the deeper you cut into the, surface of your table, the more, the, or the less likely the vacuum is going to be able to hold the part in place. Um, and uh, as you'll see, I also had an issue uh, with holding that part in place because vacuum is great when you first start out, but you have no idea 
you have some inklings that it may or may not hold, but you really have no idea if the part that you're actually cutting out, if there is enough vacuum underneath of that part to uh, hold in place during the final uh, perimeter cut. Uh, so there's a couple things that I did uh, make a mistake on, or one thing I made a mistake on, and another one that I got lucky on. Um, so uh, we'll take a look at uh, both of those, and I'll point those out at the end. Um, the one I'll see if uh, I'll, I'll point out, or I'll show the video of my blooper and uh, see if anybody could explain to me or point out what I did wrong. So anyway, uh, we're going to get started. Zero to the machine bed. And to the lower left. Um, 12 by 12 machine bed, zeroing to the lower left corner. Now all of these dimensions here, I just mentioned it again, this, there's certain preferences, there are reasons why you'd go one versus the other, but it really does not matter. What really matters is that whatever you set here on the job setup, you go, when you go to your machine, your machine is set up in the same way. So if I told the machine or here that I'm zeroing to the material surface, when I go out to the machine, I had better be setting to the material surface as well. Um, so lower left, same thing, X and Y is to this lower left. Once uh, we are all entered in here, I'm going to select OK. Now, when I start designing or start laying out a job, I don't generally worry about where in placement on the material that I'm going to cut the part out initially. Uh, I just kind of randomly place objects and uh, get it designed. And then once it's designed, then I go in and lay out and figure out where exactly in the material that I would like to have this cut. So, um, what I'm going to do first is uh, just come over and draw a rectangle under Create Vectors. And I'm going to stretch this rectangle out and just clicking. Of course, it is uh, come into whatever I had drawn last. And I'm going to reduce that to 1.75, 1 and 3 quarters. And then in the Y, I have a uh, size of 5 inches. So I'll select Apply to that then close. So I'll just point out the zoom in, zoom out, I'm using the, the mouse. Uh, and this is uh, the pan is one that I uh, didn't uh, catch uh, early on when I first started using uh, VCarve Pro. It's the center button or the mouse wheel is also a button to be able to click and it allows you to pan back and forth. So once that is uh, completed, I also created radius corners on this part here. There's two ways that I would be able to create that. Um, I always tend to forget the uh, first method, which is uh, probably one of the easier methods. By clicking the rectangle tool again, with that being selected, that means that I'm going to be modifying the selected vector. So whatever changes I make is going to be applied to that uh, rectangle. So the easiest way is uh, to set it right here to radius the external corners with a radius of 0.25. When you select apply, it automatically adds those there. I tend to forget uh, to do that, so I just did a control Z to undo that to show what I usually do. Um, rectangles I usually create with square corners, and I use the fillet tool and coming in and just entering a radius of a quarter inch here and a normal fillet. And just clicking. So you'll notice that when you hover over top of the area where you want to fill it, your mouse cursor is giving you information. So right now there's already one there. So I am getting a little X. Uh, so when I click again, it undoes or re reverts it back to a square corner uh, to create it again, hover over top, you get a little check. That check is indicating if I click, I'm going, that's going to happen. Um, so that is a quick undo, redo type of uh, thing for a fillet, dog bones, and all the other options that work just the same. So we will select close to there. Do that 
you know, just point out uh, there is something I was helping somebody uh, the other day with a uh, a knife uh, drag knife issue, and I had completely forgot all about this option down here. I was uh, explaining and uh, actually drawing out a uh, circle there, so it's always good to pay attention to uh, menus that open up because you may remember that you forgot certain options. So I have to remember that for the next time. Um, so anyway, there is my rectangle. The next thing that I wanna do is uh, the switches I got are just these little round toggle switches. The full outer diameter of the uh, switch is 0.89 inches. So for layout purposes, I want to draw a circle. And again, I'm not worried about the exact placement yet. Uh, within this rectangle. I'm just going to draw out a circle, just click and drag out, and then coming over to the diameter and entering in 0.89 for the diameter and making sure that I have the diameter selected and not the radius. Um, if I had the radius um, and I knew it was 0.89, we could do the math right here by divided by two and then equals. So that is uh, basically the same as that diameter. So I did want to have three switches um, up in here. And uh, to do that, I just used the copy array. And I copied that to be three of them in the Y direction, one column in the X. So I only want this one going up in the X and the gap between them, the X does not matter since I don't have any there. And I first started out with a gap of an eighth of an inch and selected copy. Um, I didn't quite, thought that looked a little too tight. Um, so I just did a control Z to undo that and switched it to a quarter of an inch and select copy and there it goes up. So there is also this option that allows us to group the copies. Now that uh, is a good idea to do if you're doing like a large number of uh, circles that you're going to have to toolpath later or have to select to be able to move around. Having that as a grouped copy, so when we select this, you'll now see that they are automatically as a grouped item. Um, and I'm going to leave that as a grouped item because I am going to center these circles within this rectangle. And to be able to do such a thing, we need to have these as grouped. Otherwise, it is going to center all of these circles within this circle here. So if they were not grouped, we're just going to get one, two, three circles right in the center on top of one another. So with them being grouped together, it sees this as one full um, object, even though they are still three separate objects. So to center these within this outside, we're going to use the alignment tools, selecting the circles, holding the shift key down, to do a last selected item, coming over to the align tools and center. So the next thing that I wanna do is, this is the exact outer diameter of that switch. Uh, so it has a little flange that's gonna press in and fit. So I do need to, uh, the inner section circle is 0.78. Uh, so we need to draw some circles within this, um, circle here from the centers uh, in 0.78. So there's a couple ways of doing that. Uh, since I only have three to do, I'm just gonna draw out a circle, uh, changing the diameter before I draw it. It's not too often that I do it this way, uh, but the reason I'm doing that is, so now every time I snap to the center and just click, it is giving me that circle of the selected size. So I could just continue to select the center of each one and close. So we now have the three inner circles and the inner circles here are what we're going to be using for the tool pathing or the selection of the tool path. So that is uh, almost a basic uh, complete uh, object. The one thing I did add is some mounting screw holes on the outside. I just added eighth inch diameter holes and going to do that the same way. I'm going to draw a circle changing the diameter to be 0.125. And I'm going to snap it to the center of this radius here. And if we just come over close, we can see how that snaps right into the center. 
and just simply click when you're there. All right, so now we have a completed switch plate cover for three switches. At this point is when I'm going to move it around and lay it out onto the material because where it was originally you know, placed, uh, there's end up being a lot of wasted material. So I could save material um, by simply moving this into a lower left corner. I want to move this uh, not quite at the edge because I don't have to want to have to worry about being perfectly exact on my X, Y, zero location. I want to have a little bit of room for the cutter to really engage into the material and grab a hold of it and without skipping off the edge or without me missing the, uh, the edge of the material. So to place that exactly where I would like to have it, I'm going to select all of the object by doing a sweep select and then coming over to transform move selected objects and I'm going to set it to an absolute position, which is uh, the absolute position from our zero, zero point. I'm going to set that in by 0.5 by 0.5 inches, knowing that I'm going to cut this out with a quarter inch cutter, and that will leave like a quarter inch material around the outside edge. Um, I probably could get away with uh, moving it a little bit closer and uh, not having that gap there. This is, just happens to be the way I did it. Um, all right, so now for uh, the tool pathing and figuring out what we need to do uh, to be able to cut aluminum. Uh, or it's kind of applies to everything that we want to cut. Um, the first thing we may, need to take a look at is what is the diameter of cutter that I need to use. When um, creating this and selecting the cutter diameter, it is typically best to use the largest bit possible that's still going to be able to maintain the detail within your model. So for something like this, um, if it was not for the eighth inch diameter holes on the outside corner, I would certainly use a quarter inch cutter for everything. Um, or if these holes were a quarter inch, I would definitely use those as a quarter inch cutter. Um, again, luckily I'm here at ShopBot today and uh, was able to use the desktop max with the ATC, so I don't have to worry about the tool changes. Uh, so if I was at home and using my machine at home, I may think about uh, just cutting the whole thing out with an eighth inch diameter, just so, or eighth inch diameter cutter, just so I don't have to go out and change the bits. Uh, but then again, if I was at home, um, I don't have a vacuum hold down. So I would first cut the holes out using, then using those holes, cutting those out with that eighth inch diameter bit, then using those holes for the hold down of the actual product. Uh, so I would then come through and place screws into and through those holes to be able to hold that plate in place. And, uh, We'll see in the video, that's why I did get lucky. Um, I wasn't thinking uh, when, I'm just thinking that vacuum is the cure for all hold downs. Uh, so for those of you that have a vacuum hold down, know that that is not true. Uh, just because you have a vacuum, no matter what strength or size vacuum blower you have, um, you can't always count on it to be held in place. So you always have to think about how it's gonna be held in place. and. Uh, I just made a bad assumption that uh, this vacuum was going to hold this in place. Um, reality is I didn't think about it, just got lucky. Um, so anyway, we are going to use a drilling tool path to drill these uh, holes out. I'm going to switch over to the tool path side. Um, so I've, for those that uh, first started watching these uh, weekly videos uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, I did mention early on that I really start needing to get used to this button right here that allows me to switch to the tool pass tab. I, I've really focused on that and trained myself now to click this button uh, to just switch to the tool pass side where uh, just a couple weeks ago, I'd come over here, click this tab, click the thumbtack, come over here, unclick that thumbtack to hide that. Th this button just is, uh, it, get used to using it if you're not using it. Uh, it took me a little while to, to train myself to use that. So anyway, uh, here we are uh, with our model ready to toolpath. So I'm gonna use the shift 
to do a multiple select. And I did do a sweep select from left to right on these holes. So notice when I do a right to left, everything that is inside of this bounding box and intersecting the bounding box becomes selected. Going from left to right, only objects that are entirely within the bounding box become selected. So that is a quick way, an easy way to be able to select uh, smaller components or smaller objects within a larger, uh, a larger ob object. So that is uh, for there. And what we're going to use is a drilling tool path. Now drilling into uh, aluminum is, uh, you have to be careful of the chips and uh, getting stuck down into the hole. Uh, you also have heat buildup that's uh, gonna build up in a little bit of a pause or change in direction. Uh, so a drilling tool path only goes straight down and straight back up. So for a 90 degree, or in this case, a 180 degree directional change, the machine does come to a complete stop before making a change. It's just the way physics works. Uh, there's nothing we could do about that. You shoot an arrow or straight up in the air before it comes back down, it pauses as it changes direction. Just the same thing that happens here. When it goes down, it's gonna go down and stop before it makes its direction change. And that little bit of a stop is enough to build up some heat. And that heat is going to possibly break the bit. Uh, we also, if we go straight down without any release or lift up, we're going straight down. We're also creating this curl type of chip that allows itself or could allow itself to wrap around the cutter. And once it gets wrapped around, it could cause a little bit of a wedge or a binding and just snap that cutter off. So the way that we could get around that is by using a peck drilling. Uh, peck drilling is where it goes down, pause, down, pause. Um, so with every time it goes down, it can, depending on your retract uh, gap, come back out of the material and go back down. So there's uh, two options here. Is uh, One is retract above the cutting start depth. Uh, so my cutting start depth is at the uh, zero depth, not to confuse that with the table surface or where it's zero that's completely separate from what this start depth is. This start depth is referring to the top of uh, the material. Where are you starting? Uh, well, we're starting our cut from the top of the material, not where we have it zeroed. Zero is still to the table surface. And I'm cutting down from our start depth an eighth of an inch. So I'm essentially drilling down an eighth of an inch. While there could be a slight problem with that, is I had set the material thickness to be an eighth of an inch. If I'm cutting down to exactly an eighth of an inch, I may not go all the way through the material. And especially drilling into aluminum, if you get it too close, you get these little uh, tinfoil dimples that as it, as it pushes through. So I really should cut a little bit deeper. I typically go 10 thousandths deeper so we're going to just change that two to a three. And I've selected an eighth inch bit. I'm going to take a second here to look at how I have uh, my tool database organized. Um, I've just recently installed uh, the Aspire 10, so I haven't had a chance to completely clean up uh, my database uh, and get it, get it set. Uh, for starters, uh, typically what I initially do first is go in and open up and just delete the, the default tooling. Um, mainly because when I go to actually cut or select this bit, I could, you know, we got all these bits here just because they're in this tool database and they will allow me to be used to create the tool pathing. They may not have these bits in my, my tool chest. Uh, so now I'm gonna have to order a bit wait for it to come in. So what I typically like to do is just come through and hit the trash can, delete everything out, and enter into my library or my database only bits that I truly own. Uh, that way there's no mistaking that I could go out to the garage or out to the shop and cut this product without having to 
come back into the office and say, I really need to calculate this based on this other cutter that I had because I thought I had that. So that's one thing that I uh, like to do is uh, organize my database to tooling that I actually have. The other thing that um, I will do is uh, create groupings um, within here. So we have an eighth inch end mill here and a quarter inch end mill here underneath of the aluminum category. We also have a quarter inch end mill and an eighth inch end mill under the imperial tool. So they're really the same and could be the same fit. Uh, typically, I might have one in here for plastic. I haven't cut uh, a whole lot of plastic since installing this, so I haven't taken the time for this. Um, but this allows you to be able to just quickly come in and say, okay, today I'm cutting aluminum. My eighth inch bit is what I want to use for drilling. That already has my preset aluminum tool pathing or tooling set up in place. So you can see the difference uh, really in here is probably most likely this pass step. So if I go to the other eighth inch end mill, you can see this pass step is uh, much larger uh, than what I had for aluminum. I also had the RPM set a little bit lower and uh, the feed rate also a little lower than I do for the aluminum cutting. So for the aluminum, I am up at 18,000 rather than 12,000. Uh, so this is a way to organize and set the speeds and different tooling based on the material. So when today you're cutting aluminum, rather than just changing all these numbers, I have a pre-selected uh, tool that I could use for uh, cutting that eighth inch aluminum. And if for whatever reason I cut this aluminum today and it failed uh, to where this eighth inch cutter was really not the right cutter to use or it broke or I just did something wrong about it, I would also typically come back into that file um, and into the tool database and give myself a little note. Um, that might say uh, something like today, you know, last time I cut at 18,000, it kind of gummed up a little bit. It got a little soft um, and started melting. Didn't give me a clean cut. Next time, try cutting at 17,000 uh, or, you know, just little notes to myself. So the next time I go to cut aluminum, which may be tomorrow or a month from now, I know and have a record of what I did the last time. Uh, so if uh, I go to cut aluminum the next time, I see that note, like, okay, yep, I'm, I'm going to try it this time and change it to 17,000 and cut. And if it works better, I will come back in, wipe out that note that I had there and say, yes, 17,000 looked to be good. Next time, try maybe a little bit lower. Uh, but the reason why I did set this up to 18,000 for the eighth inch cutter is I wanted it to produce a slightly smaller chip. Um, mainly because I wanted a smaller chip not to get caught up into that hole and cause binding. But at the same time, by creating the smaller chip, I also created more heat in, in the cutter. Uh, so this is the reason that I chose to peck drill and retract above the start depth. So come back to that, selecting that eighth inch cutter, apply then select. And I did choose to use the peg drilling and I'm retracting above the start depth. Um, and the reason I'm coming up out of the material and that is to allow and pull out the chip, uh, uh, allow room for the chip to be ejected out of that hole that I just drilled. And the retract um, gap I just came out at just you know ten thousandths of an inch, just enough to come back out before it goes back down. So the way it works is, if you remember, in the start depth or the um, sorry the uh, max depth or the pass depth, I had at ten thousandths. So the way it works is it that is what it's used to know how far to go down before retracting back up. So for this case, for the drill, the first plunge, it's going to go down. 10,000s come 10,000s out of the material. Second time, it goes down to 20,000s, 
back out of the material by 10 thousandths, back down 30 thousandths. So it keeps stepping down in uh, doing that uh, until it gets all the way through. And just to give a, a demonstration of that, uh, here is a uh, video of what it was that I was actually cutting. And you could see the, the, the stepping as it's up and down motion um, as it's cutting there. So every time it goes down, it is coming out of the material by that 10 thousandths of an inch. And that just allows that chip to be cleared um, and get it out of the, uh, the hole so it doesn't get bound up and stuck. Um, so that was uh, the tool path that we just created for those four holes right here. So retract that into the material coming up out of it, 10 thousandths of an inch. This is one option you would not want to use for cutting aluminum. Um, you would not want to dwell at the bottom of the cut. Um, the final thing is to give it a name. I only had one drilling tool pass, so I wasn't worried about actually naming it anything specifically. Uh, but typically, if you have a lot of varying hole sizes or bit diameters or you know features that you're doing here, I would definitely recommend giving it a clean, clear descriptive name, um, not getting too long to where it, you know, you have to read a book every time you want to open up and see what your tool pals are doing. Uh, but just something short, sweet that explains what is uh, happening here. So once that is done, we can click calculate. I am getting a warning. Uh, again, I say it every time I see this message, uh, to always look to see if that decimal is really there. Um, so it is that's that 10 thousandths that we specified to go all the way through. So I'm good with that. And we'll say, okay. Um, so yes, uh, VCurve Pro um, has a, a peg drilling option as well. Um, so everything that uh, I'm doing here, even though I'm working in the Spire, I just don't have a new version of uh, VCurve Pro um, installed on this computer but all the same features that I'm working with here in Aspire are also available in VCarve Pro. Uh, so same uh, as if I was working in VCarve Pro right now. So the one thing that happens here is I'm now in the 3D view and I have the preview button here and I will just simply click the preview button that boom, 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 there's the three holes that's looking good. Um, don't believe that the tool pathing uh, shows the motion of the steps of a drill. And maybe a little bit you're able to see it there. Um, it would be nice if we had some sort of a mark um, to say, okay, one, two, three. But then again, maybe that's what these little dots are right there. Um, so we could see that it is stepping down by that uh, 10 thousandths uh, peck drilling that I have. So the next step that we I created was the profile tooling for the inner circles to be able to uh, cut those out. And this is also uh, where a tool change has been issued because I have a tool changer uh, at work that I'm able to use. So I used it and uh, chose to cut this out with a quarter inch cutter. Um, I could have just left the eighth inch cutter and did that as well. Uh, but uh, in watching this video uh, with the tool pathing in the circles, you'll see why I probably uh, elected not to use that eighth inch uh, cutter. The eighth inch uh, cutter, which is an O flute that I used, uh, becomes a very small, easily breakable bit. Um, so any kind of vibration or bounce or anything, you know, just look at the thing wrong, uh, the bit is, uh, could break. Uh, so I didn't want to have to worry about breaking the bit. Um, so I did change tools and move on to a quarter inch cutter. So to set up the tool path for the circles, just simply selected all of what I want a tool path and came over to create a profile tool path. And again, I'm going to cut down to the material thickness plus ten thousandths of an inch. So we could do that by simply coming in here and uh, cutting the, setting the cut depth to the value of Z plus 0.01 and then if it equals it stays there. 
uh, it, it equates that for me. Um, another trick uh, to this, just a side note off of um, here, I, if you have a project that you're cutting over and over and over again, uh, but sometimes you cut the same project out in half inch material, sometimes you cut it out in quarter inch material. Um, so the, the basic parameters all stay the same, but the uh, material depth changes a little bit. Well, we could always just leave this value in here the way it is. Uh, we don't have to give a value. It could stay in here just as it is right here, and it will do this for us. So when we hover over top of this, it gives us a little tooltip of what that value is. So that's just a little side note that I'm going to leave just the way it is here. Then for the tooling that I'm going to use is selecting the tool, the quarter inch cutter. Uh, for the quarter inch cutter, I uh, am still cutting to a pass depth of 0.01 and setting the spindle speed a little bit lower, which is increasing the size of the chip. Um, there is, even though I didn't do that with the eighth inch cutter um, for the reasons that I explained, um, but typically most of the time you want to load the cutter up. You want to be able to cut as big of a chip as possible, remove as much material off of that edge of the material as that bit is going to allow. Uh, when I say allow, meaning almost taking it to the breaking point. Um, allow the cutter to do what the cutters are designed for, that's to cut. So uh, allow that cutter to, to take the load and uh, remove the material. The bigger chip you take out, the less heat is going to build up on that cutter. Um, especially cutting aluminum, uh, it's amazing how hot those chips get if you have the feed rate set just right. Uh, and the, the chips are what become hot, not the material itself. So you're removing the heat with the chip. Um, and that is done so by taking a large, uh, large material out. So lowering the RPM allows me to create a bigger chip. I also increase the feed rate, which is actually um, also creating a larger chip. So I kind of doubled down here a little bit. Um, I increased, decreased the RPM and increased the feed rate, which is uh, creating the, um, a larger chip. So um, got a question about uh, the, the type of bit. Yes, uh, the question is, am I using a different bit or cutter than I would in wood? Um, absolutely. Uh, there is, uh, even though router bits, all router bits are not created equal, um, the geometry of the cutter that you select uh, needs to be correct for that type of material. So if you have cut aluminum before, um, you get a little bit of a, uh, I call them like cat claws. Uh, they, they look like little cat claws that come off of the machine. And they're a little crescent type shape um, cutter. So a, an O flute has this shape um, in, in the cutter that kind of naturally, or that matches the natural shape of the chip coming off of the material. Soft plastics um, produce a very similar type of chip, only uh, soft plastics, they, they curl in the same way that aluminum does but uh, they curl a little bit farther around because we are able to take a bigger cut in plastic, uh, in soft plastic, that um, also uh, the O-flute uh, works well for that. Um, now hard plastics uh, does not create these curled chips. They create little straight, you know, vertical square rectangular type chips. So in a case of harder plastic, uh, is one that you would use a straight cutter uh, for. Uh, wood, kind of the same thing. You want to match the cutter shape diameter to the type of uh, chip that's going to be produced. So this is another thing that I use the uh, notes for here is um, telling it what cutter brand I'm using and what geometry it has and how well it cuts. Um, 
uh, for this. Uh, so uh, that is that. Um, got a question about the number of flutes. Do I always use a single flute cutter? Well, O flutes uh, really can only come in a single flute uh, cutter, um, mainly because an O flute is naturally, or it does not have, it's an unbalanced cutter. Um, so let's uh, see what uh, Google uh, does. Um, Go over here to the images and take a look to see if we have any images of an O flute uh, straight on, which does not look like uh, we are going to have any right off the bat. But here is an O flute cutter. Uh, so the center line of this cutter, as it goes from top to bottom, none of the cutting edges fall within that center. So you have to be careful of using an O flute that is uh, too large uh, because since it is unbalanced uh, and you, you can't have a balanced bit in this way, that uh, it, a bigger bit, bigger diameter bit with that unbalanced could uh, you know, really vibrate your machine uh, around uh, quite a bit. So going back to what I originally said, um, using the biggest bit possible that's gonna allow its detail, you also have certain considerations with the type or the style of bit that you're going to use. Uh, so quarter inch uh, in on a desktop, I wouldn't go with a three, three eighths uh, O flute on a desktop. Full size machine, there's enough weight uh, to absorb uh, any of that uh, unbalanced there. On a desktop, you start getting closer to where the vibration of that unbalanced bit could show up in the uh, quality and edge of the cut. Um, but that is uh, the reason for having this set to a uh, number of flutes to one. Uh, if I wanted to have a smaller chip and still maintain the feed rate and RPM that I had in here, um, I could make that number of flutes two if they made such a cutter and that would uh, reduce the chip size or it's also known as chip load. I'm not quite certain why they call it load. I mean, we are loading up a bit, uh, but to make it uh, more understandable to, uh, to us woodworkers is chip size. Um, so that is uh, what chip load is, is really uh, the measurable size chip that is being produced off of that material. So once I select uh, this bit, selecting apply, then close, we can see that I'm taking a total of 14 passes through this material. Now, there's two ways of thinking of this. That's a lot of material. I know some people cut a little bit deeper and slower. Um, I like to cut faster at a lower RPM and both get done about the same time. Um, so we'll, we'll see the video on how this cuts, but um, there's that. Um, I am cutting this on the inside of the selected vectors. Going to use a conventional uh, cutting. Um, talk about this almost every time I uh, bring up uh, profiling, uh, climb versus conventional. It is uh, all in the quality of edge of which one you select. One is going to pr produce a cleaner edge than the other. So in this case, I am doing a conventional cut which means if I'm correct, the scrap disc that gets removed here is the getting the climb part applied to it. The quality of the edge of the disc that's getting removed, the scrap, should be not as clean as the inner hole that I want. And you should always compare the scrap to the finished product. If your scrap has the cleaner edge than what your product is or what you really want to keep, change the direction. Um, and aluminum, this is one that goes both ways. Uh, depending on the uh, hardness, softness of the aluminum uh, make, makes a difference. Uh, we'll mention the easiest type of aluminum to cut is a 6061 T6. That is a, a aluminum that is, it's a harder aluminum, which you think, well, why would I want to 
the softer aluminum would be easier to cut. Well, the problem that you have with soft aluminum is it melts very easily, gets gummy, and likes to stick to the bit, weld itself onto the bit, and um, it's just very hard to cut a soft, uh, soft aluminum. It can be done. Uh, you might need to use coolant and, and such to uh, help uh, help with that. But um, I cut this dry, uh, and typically most uh, aluminum cutting that I do that is the alloy of 6061 T6. Um, I don't typically use any kind of uh, lubricant or uh, uh, coolant on it. Um, if I do, um, we do have a Mister um, that. Uh, uh, is able to mist the product, and uh, I would use uh, denatured alcohol in the mister to where we're spraying it with the alcohol that uh, does two things. One, the alcohol uh, does not make a mess uh, because it evaporates quickly, um, and it also, that evaporation of the alcohol also helps to cool and um, Keep, keep the material cool. Just uh, the evaporation is removing the heat and uh, that, that helps a lot. It also keeps things clean. Uh, another issue that I sometimes have with a lubricant, I know a lot of people use like soapy water or there's, uh, the, there are actual coolant uh, products out there that you could use. Um, what typically happens to me is uh, when I do use a liquid coolant that kind of hangs around and doesn't evaporate away, kind of gets down into the curve of the cut, then all the chips are not able to get cleared out. So as it's cutting around, those chips are kind of getting ground, reground and building up and getting stuck into the kerf. Even though they're like not stuck in there, they, they just kind of float around down there and get bound up and get reground and I don't, I don't like that. I like to have the uh, chips just fly out of the, the cutter or out of the kerf. And if the chips are not building up in there and you have your feed rate and uh, your RPM set correctly, the heat is getting removed with that chip, which that chip is then being ejected out of the kerf. All right, so that is direction climb versus conventional. Another feature that I really like to use in especially cutting a circle is the ramps. Uh, cutting into aluminum, I always use a ramp, uh, but when cutting circles, I always use the spiral. Uh, that allows us to start at the surface of the material or at what we specified our start depth to be, and it makes one full revolution as the Z is also cutting to depth until it gets back to its starting point and then does a uh, motion around to um, do its uh, final pass. So it will do that 10 thousandths at a time until we reach our max depth of our 135. So again, we would give this a name since I ain't, do have two separate profiles. I am going to name this one circles. Calculate, again, I get this warning, we'll say okay. And that looks good. We'll just kind of zoom in here and see what the uh, path is looking like. It's so close together, it's kind of hard to see the spiraling, spiraling action that's happening here. But you see it's starting here and it's just going all the way around in a spiral uh, kind of tapping type of motion until it reaches the max depth. So we could preview what this looks like. Now, uh, well, I'll show this in the video, uh, and you can see what's happening here. This is something I should have caught in the, uh, the previewing of when I cut this, but um, we, we, we always say that there's two types of uh, people that make the most mistakes uh, when they come into the CNC world or when they're using CNC. Uh, the two types of person is the beginner and the experienced. Uh, the beginner is going to make mistakes just because they don't know. Uh, exactly what, what's going on or what's going to happen or what they're doing. Uh, so they're going to make mistakes just because of the unknown. The experienced person is going to make the mistakes because they know. Uh, they have become overconfident in their knowledge that uh, I don't need to preview this anymore. I know what's going to happen. Um, 
But if I were to cut this out and I'll show in the video why I got lucky, what do you think is going to happen or what is happening with these pieces as they get cut out? Um, and uh, as we'll see in this video, it's going back to make its tool change now. And you see, as, as it's here, I have this piece of, uh, you know, Lexan sheet and some this blue plastic over here. This is a vacuum table. And uh, basically what I've done is just kind of covered it up so that uh, we wouldn't, uh, to help maximize the vacuum underneath the part that I actually want. So it is going through that spiraling action. You can see the chips being ejected out of the kerf. They're not getting built up inside of there. Now, if I use some soapy water, the chips might, you know, not be uh, ejected out. Um, but now watch that centerpiece. Uh, you see it just kind of went away. Um, <laughs> it, it got yanked and pulled out. Um, so if I were cutting with a eighth inch cutter, that, um, circle that was left, that scrap piece that got ejected out, um, may have been enough of a bounce uh, up against that eighth inch cutter for that to break the cutter. So I um, had gotten lucky that uh, it did not break the cutter and that it ejected out in the correct, uh, correct pass. Um, stop that there and uh, come back to show a couple things that I could do to prevent that from happening. Uh, one is uh, I could use a pocketing to completely remove all of that material uh, and kind of just eat it away to where I do not have that little bit of a scrap there. Uh, I may set up another or a double profile for that. So an example is going into the circle, I'm going to right click and make a duplicate of that going to bump that duplicate up into the top, double clicking on that duplicate, and I want to offset uh, an offset allowance of say, uh, let's see what an eighth of an inch does. So what that has done is created two separate profiling tool paths. Um, and I'm going to uncheck uh, this use solid um, toolpath here. So we can see this is the one toolpath that I offset inward by an eighth of an inch, and then this is the second one. And I put them in the order to where it will then cut, let's reset this preview. I will preview only the first one that has the offsetted and reset and preview that visible toolpath. So I am leaving a little bit of a circle there. I could offset it in just a little bit more, um, but that now has removed the, uh, the majority chunk of material that's going to get ejected out that would most likely hit an eighth inch cutter and just, you know, break it. Uh, then I would come and cut this uh, circle here uh, and we'll preview that one. And that is one way to eliminate uh, the toolpaths. Uh, some might be thinking that, well, why not just use tabs? Uh, that's a great, uh, great function and a purpose of a tab. Well, I'm inside of this hole. I don't have to want to have to worry about cleaning up, filing off, uh, and getting rid of that tab. Um, so this type of method, I think, works a little bit better uh, for the uh, circle uh, or interior components uh, versus tabs. Now, if it were a bigger circle or a bigger rectangle, yes, I probably would use tabs and not completely remove that. But for something like this, it has uh, worked out uh, pretty good. So those are the two interior circles. Uh, the final uh, pass was to do a profiling toolpath. Just select it. I have all the same parameters that were there from the tool pathing of the profile of the circles there. So I don't have to select the cutter again. The same passes are listed. I do want to change to the outside. I do not want to do a spiral on this because that's 
a long time to go around, but I do want to have a smooth ramp into the material and uh, setting that there, giving it a name of cut and calculate. So that is the, um, you know, the majority of uh, how to cut um, this. So there's a couple things that I did as a mistake, got the same type of issue as this cuts out. You saw I did no tabbing and I have this big piece that's probably not gonna be held down by the vacuum. So uh, what I'm gonna do now as uh, we have any questions, uh, please feel free to use the chat. Um, at this time, I'm also going to uh, allow people to unmute yourself. So if you have a, uh, a question, uh, just click your uh, microphone to unmute it. And um, while people are getting used to that, I'm just going to click play here so we can see how lucky I got. Or that inner circle just uh, got removed, uh, even though I showed. This is again uh, what I learned after the fact, or really, I didn't learn it, I just uh, relearned <laughs> what I should do, and that is uh, better prepare um, and preview and um, verify uh, the cut is as I would like it to cut. So you can see the uh, the chips coming off of there. Uh, like I said, they are uh, little, uh, you know, cat claw like, um, and that chip is uh, the kind of the natural product uh, of uh, what the chip looks like, and uh, the cutter of that oak loop kind of matches up to that that chip. And there's where I got lucky. Um, so it cut all the way through and just kind of ejected that piece uh, right out of the um, uh, the part, which uh, was very amazing that it really did no marking or damage. That it, it threw it out. It just like couldn't have planned it better. I wish I could do that type of you know finish cut and yeah, just place it over there when I'm done cutting. Um, so the feed rate. Uh, that I uh, used for this was a three inches per second in X and Y, two inches per second in the Z with an RPM of 14,000, uh, which uh, did, I don't have the actual product with me, it's uh, out in my van um, already, but uh, it, it did produce a very clean, uh, shiny edge um, that I uh, really don't need to do any work uh, to it after the fact. Um, it did leave a little bit of a mark on the side uh, where uh, it did eject it out. Um, but for the most part, that, that little mark was uh, fine with me. I, it's, it's acceptable. So that is uh, my steps and processes of creating a, a aluminum and setting up for an aluminum cut. Uh, again, it was 6061 T6 is what is going to typically give you the, uh, the easiest uh, cut and also the cleanest cut. Uh, again, going softer aluminum, not always the best thing. It's gonna get gummy, melty, and uh, stick to the cutter. So the bit uh, on that, I don't know the exact number, uh, what it was, but it was definitely an on-through bit. It was a, an O-flute uh, cutter. Um, one thing that I uh, also uh, mentioned is uh, you should also look at the length of cutter that you have, or the, the, the overall cut depth of that, because this O-flute cutter, uh, the geometry is what we're looking for. Uh, we could get the cutter length in a variety of lengths. Uh, this one had a cutter length of three quarters of an inch. Um, 
I used that only because that's what was already in the machine. Uh, but if I was cutting multiples of these and like going into production, I would not have used that length cutter. I would have used a cutter that had a uh, cut length of a quarter of an inch. I'm only cutting eighth inch material. I don't need to use uh, such a long cutter length. And what that does by reducing the overall cutting length, and that is the distance from the end of the collet that is uh, outside of this, um, that reduces the amount that that bit is capable of flexing and is going to give you a cleaner cut. So don't think that um, when you're cutting, try to match the cutter length uh, to the material uh, as well. Oh, let me point out my mistake. Um, so uh, I forgot I was gonna show this. Um, so on, on this video, as we saw, I did um, have a uh, material over top of the, uh, the backside of the vacuum. Um, and uh, I um, made a mistake here that the first time that I put on here, I had, uh, just had a piece of three quarter inch uh, material uh, that I grabbed to throw, throw over the back side there. Well, there's one setting that you need to pay attention to uh, when doing something like that, that it's found under this material setup, the set. It is this clearance uh, gap here. Uh, so this is as the cutter moves from one feature to the next, this is how far up out of the material it's going to go. And uh, in this uh, project, um, as it first started out, um, any guesses of what happened when I cut here? Yeah, right there. So it went down straight through that material coming down to its starting point. So um, I, two things that I should have done or one that I should have done, paid attention to, and I should have known that that was gonna happen. Um, so I could have corrected it by first not using that three quarter inch board as a stop for the vacuum, or I could have corrected the height of the um, uh, the, the retract uh, gap above the material in the Aspire setting. It's best to set the um, material uh, thinner uh, just because the closer you're cutting to the material, the faster the overall cut will be uh, just because of the uh, amount of time that it Z comes up out of the material. So uh, there is a request for more uh, indexer uh, training. So uh, maybe uh, is uh, could do a repeat of uh, the indexer uh, training uh, that uh, I did a couple weeks ago uh, that I ended up recording it um, and uh, didn't do it live. Uh, maybe we might get some more question and answers uh, that way. So maybe I'll do a repeat uh, next week uh, to show more about indexers. Maybe just a video in general about accessories. Uh, you know, there's drag knives, uh, both the Donick knife and the Widget Works vinyl cutter, uh, indexers. Uh, the desktop has a uh, an edge clamp uh, that is great for cabinet makers to do uh, joinery work. Um, what other, uh, you know, a probe, a uh, touch probe, that could be a good one to, uh, to talk about. All right, well, that is uh, gonna be it for us today. Um, glad to have you here. Uh, thank you for the questions.